Well, dealing with the fixed price milestones was probably the more challenging part of the, uh, the program from a uh, business management standpoint. Uh, and somewhat from a program management standpoint, um, on a cost plus program, you know, you you accomplish the work, you get you bill for it, and you get paid for it, and you have a projected uh, revenue stream that will pretty well cover what you have to do. And if there are problems, the customer and the vendor work them together on whom, in terms of who's responsible for overruns or schedule delays, things like that. On fixed price, the most of the risk goes to the uh, supplier. And in this case, Orbital um, took that risk, and we followed the cash profile very carefully, but we never actually exceeded the cost with the cash input. And so that was um, uh, a challenge for the company to manage. And we had to manage it very tightly. But it also, I think, proved that we could do this kind of partnership with the government in a way that... that um, didn't take down the program, if you know what I mean. And that's what's happened in the past on a lot of these that are more ambitious, is you just can't afford it anymore because you can't keep up with the changes or you can't fund the changes and you can't d decide or agree on who's responsible for either the changes or the problems that are occurring. In this case, both sides took responsibility for what they had signed up to um, and, and we eventually brought it all together in a successful demonstration flight that, that proved we could, in fact, deliver cargo. It took a heavy investment by the company. It took some risks on the part of the government uh, because they also had to invest in some facilities and other support structure that ensured that, that the NASA facilities that were responsible for being a part of this um, could, in fact, uh, uh, fulfill their obligations. But what it did was it laid the groundwork for the commercial resupply contract, which is also fixed price uh, that was coming later. The difference between the Space Act agreement and the fixed price contract, however, is that once the Space Act agreement is funded, it's very rare for the government to actually come in and give you more money just because you have problems or even because they've changed the requirements on you. They're not obligated to give you more money to comply with those changed requirements. So it puts a lot of burden on the contractor to, to do it as cost effectively and efficiently as possible. When you're working a Space Act agreement, get as much of the agreement in writing as you can. If you make changes, get that in writing also. And if it's a little bit of a, or if the situation becomes one where the company is doing this and, and, and the uh, government needs you to do that, um, but in the end you both get what you need to, you need to document it, but you may not need to start charging each other for the for the changes because in the end, if you can run a balance sheet, it usually works out so that both sides are taking the same amount of risk or whatever. But the, the flip side of that is you cannot put the company in a position where they're going to take a loss on something that's going to benefit the government because the stockholders won't won't stand for that. And, um, and you're not going to get many opportunities to run something at a loss and, and keep going with the same team. So you've got to be sensitive to what position the government is putting a company in in that situation. By the same token, the government has to justify what they're doing to Congress and what they're investing in. And so they need to have a good relationship with the company and that, that we can prove that, what, that they're getting their money's worth, basically. And, uh, and it can all be documented and all can be shown. And in the end, you can show a product that actually benefits the taxpayer. In the case of COTS, the government put in a large amount of money, the, the companies committed to a large amount of money, and we're putting it in along, all along the way. We had a schedule of payments that everybody agreed to. Uh, what we didn't have that I think might have helped the system was um, a way of, of coming back and saying, this isn't exactly what both sides signed up to. How are we going to negotiate these changes? Who's going to pay for them? Uh, what, who deals with the schedule impacts? What happens if an obligation on one side or the other isn't fulfilled because we really didn't understand it or didn't outline it well? You, you need some type of a, of a uh, change mechanism to, to deal with that. Uh, I don't know if that's allowable in the law for OTAs or Space Act agreements. Um, I think there are ways to do it, but it, it needs to be a part of the system so you don't reach an impasse and you don't get people threatening to just pull the plug and, and walk away, which actually either side could do at any time in a Space Act agreement. Not that anybody threatened that, but, but that was kind of uh, the reality of the landscape we were operating in. And we had seen that happen on other programs and other companies, and we didn't want that to happen here. 
largely because of the company reputation on the line, supporting the International Space Station and the crews that are up there and the future of human spaceflight for the country. But you need something to give people a way of dealing with big changes that come along.